All right, everybody, welcome into the SPL Extension, which is the NASCC. My name is Judas Priestley, joined this evening by Kaizo, and today we have the Athenian Sages versus the Valhalla Valkyries, known and thought by many people to be some of our best two teams in this SCC grouping. I'm excited for what we're going to see today. Yeah, these are, if you haven't been following the SCC very closely, or this is perhaps your first time joining us, this is probably going to be the game that you recognize the most players in, because particularly for the Valhalla Valkyries, these are a lot Absolutely. of the guys that have played at the SPL level. You've probably seen them over the years. I know Aquarius, Sam for Soccer, guys that have definitely been up there. Wowie, and I think Gamma as well has been up in that upper echelon also. So even if you haven't been following us for very long, you no doubt will recognize a lot of these players. And like you said, Judas, these are... Two of our top teams, two of our most performing teams, obviously the Athenian stage is no slouches either. So if you wanted to see perhaps what the best of the SCC has to offer, then we might be bringing it to you right here. Yep, veteranship on the rosters. Let's see if that translates to veteranship in the draft as we head on in to picks and bands for this first game. And this is, of course, being played just before the bonus balance update. So we still have Bountiful Bow being a particularly popular recipe. But mm. without those changes, guys, we've actually still been seeing a lot of uh, party punch, particularly in the SCC for EU this morning. I actually saw three party punch pickups uh, on the Niflheim Warg. So uh, what are you expecting to see today with these drafts? Is it anything too different to what we've been seeing in the SPL this weekend? Different is a weird word to use right now, Judas, because it is so much different right now than pretty much any other meta that we've seen in Smite, at least in the last several years, with all of the warriors and assassins playing in roles that you don't typically see them in. If you watch the previous set that went on just before us, you got to see Solo or Troll play Raijin solo two games in a row and win both of those games and look good on that role playing that character. So it's... It's a vastly different landscape than we're accustomed to seeing at the competitive level. And I think it's incredibly interesting to see which teams want to toy around a little bit more with some of the new stuff, some of the, I don't want to call it weird anymore, but it's definitely different than what we've been seeing. And then you have teams that want to keep it pretty simple. Like we had, uh, I think yesterday, there was a set in the EU SCC where they just picked Scylla and went 13 and two on Scylla. And it looked very, very two. good. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if it's not as though you have to play your, your Pele mids that you were seeing Videnu play, you can still pick pretty much standard smite and then have at least some success with it. It's just up to the teams, up to the players, what they want to do and how they want to pilot these more interesting picks. Well, the pick that is somewhat not interesting anymore is this Allrun being top picked by the Sages. We've seen it even last weekend, I remember, absolutely dominate certain games. You can just put this pick into the duo lane and it, it's going to run the show as long as you support it correctly. And uh, interesting to note, actually, Kaizo, for the Athenian Sages, uh, player on the roster, you mentioned some recognizable names, Jengaru in the jungle for the Sages. This is, of course, the uh, final game that Jengaru did play for the Sages in the SEC before being promoted to the SPL. So <laughs> expecting big things uh, to come through, of course, playing in the jungle rather than the mid lane. But getting back to What's actually happening right here? Pele Amaterasu locked in for the Valks. Uh, if you're going to match up against an all run, it's probably the best way to do it. I disagree with you there, and I love disagree with, disagreeing with you, Judas, because you it makes me look it. so much smarter. So I will say, I think that if you're looking for something only to kill an all run, then I think that Kamazots is usually my best pick to do that. True. Because I obviously, as soon as you get that sanctified field charge out of the ADC, once Olara no longer Fox has that, you strike. banish yourself up into the bat out of hell, and then he can't touch you up there. And then you just wait out his most useful defensive cooldown. I think that Pele Amaterasu are just kind of good right now. I don't think they're necessarily a pick and counter pick kind of situation for the Valkyries here. You can argue that they effectively up. shut down the Olorun. Those are definitely picks that have, I would argue, positive matchups into the Olorun. But it's not necessarily only because we see them grab that one that they take away the Pele and the Ama. And it's worth noting also, Pele can go in the jungle. We've been seeing a lot of her in the mid lane. Ven just got done playing that one in the mid lane. Didn't work out for them, but has had a lot of success across all levels of play, pretty much all the way from top competitive smite all the way down to the gold, bronze, silver league. So 
it's definitely one that has some flexibility and doesn't really show a whole lot about what the Valkyries are doing. Interesting uh, Kuzumbo pickup here from the Sages. Kuzumbo actually came into this uh, phase of the SEC as one of the top guards in the game, funnily enough. Uh, I don't remember any major changes, but all of a sudden, you know, the, the giant turtle has been seen less and less. But Sol actually coming through from the Valks. Another pick that, uh, again, very popular at the start of year 10. Pretty much disappeared off the face of the earth and now is coming back just because of the popularization of these magical adcs but why is it that sol is much less popular than say Oleron and freya we do see a little bit of chronos but not so much of him either what is it about sol that puts it at this sort of mid stage yeah sol's probably like one tier below where you would put freya and Oleron, and it is mostly the defensive capabilities of freya and Oleron that are just a little bit better than sol Sol is still pretty defensive. The Disapparate's a great defensive tool. She has CC immunity, has some good instantaneous self-peel from the, the Supernova knockup, but it doesn't quite get the job done as much as the Oleron does. Come Oleron and Freya also a very right. good wave one and two pressure, which is pretty important when you want to lock Let down that first shield buff, making sure that you are the first team to it, and that is a very important cooldown to make sure that you can get for yourself. So it's less that she is bad and more that the other two do things that you want an ADC to do a little bit better right now. Very tanky pair of picks coming out from the Athenian City Shield. Tyr and Nike. Very likely to be a Nike in the jungle, I would assume, and a Tyr in the solo lane. Uh, so the Valks having to deal with, uh, well, a, a bit of a, a bit of a protect the king composition here. Presumably that's a set in the mid lane as well, which means that, you know, Kuzumbo set, Tyr, and Nike all going to be diving hell or higher water. Um, Oleron, however, sitting more on the backside, so I do wonder how the Valks will manage to stand up to that, but, uh, good news, Kaisers, we won't have to worry for very long, we're just gonna head right on in to game number one between the Athenian Sages and the Valhalla Valkyries, but we see both these drafts line up against each other, and yeah, the Athenian Sages do put Jengaru on the Nike in that jungle, uh, I don't know, how, how do you see this composition going? Uh, the Nike kind of throws a monkey wrench in the plans for me because that's not one that we see a whole lot of. I think of players like Scream when I see Nike Jungle. Not necessarily that that's his number one pick, but it's just that style of, hey, I don't think I can tell you the last time I've seen this in the jungle is probably what the enemy team is thinking. A lot of Smite is matchup knowledge and understanding what the characters want to do at any given stage of the game. And when you play something like a Nike in the jungle that you don't have a ton of experience against, you lose a good bit of that matchup knowledge and then it's mostly on the fly adaptation. Now that's not to suggest that they didn't know Jangaru might be picking this. It's more to say that they don't have the best practice against it because very few people likely are picking this. It's going to be interesting to see how he decides to play the map, especially alongside this set, because one would think that they have very good invade potential between these two against the Pele and the Thor, who want to play more of a poke style game and then use their global presence from the Thor ult, versus Jangara and Nehu just want to outright run you down with pretty overwhelming damage. Uh, it's been uh, a common pickup sometimes, this Nike, into Freya specifically. Uh, Freya, of course, when you activate those Pulse Autos, means that that is when you are going to be outputting damage. But Sol doesn't really suffer from that. Uh, of course, does have a little bit of a boost through the passive of when the auto attacks are particularly strong. But even then, it's it's still not that big of a window for Jengaro to lock down. Jengaro getting locked down themselves, has to leap away, gets hit with a double tap. Sam for soccer, not able to get the kill. Nice skewer there coming out from Nehu. Dishes out some damage in response, but poking and prodding in this mid lane is where all the action is right now. And Jangaru seems very comfortable with his own health bar and what defensive tools he has available oh. to him. But hang on, Griff does not seem as comfortable. Falling over there for first blood against Wowie on the soul. And this is a very volatile matchup, the way these magical ADCs work. They're pretty even in pressure. One can basically contest the other fairly comfortably. But if you throw one of them a lead, if you give them the opportunity to just stand in front of the enemy with an excellent itemization advantage in particular, I'm talking one tier of a ring over the other is enough to really tilt these scales. And the Valhalla Valkyries, if they weren't already planning to play around Gamma and Wowie, have 
certainly sent a message to Sam for soccer and said, hey, our soul is ahead. We can keep that going and go for some of these purple buff invades, back camp invades, lock down that shield buff. It opens up another facet of the map that otherwise would have been pretty balanced, wouldn't have had a whole bunch of opportunity, and now gives them something to swing at if they need to target. Uh, maybe a bit of a worry for Griff there is, did actually fall with the purification beads still up? Uh, leads me to believe it was just too much poking and prodding. Uh, Gamma, of course, on this Terra, we did see a lot of Terra being played by them uh, in the previous phase of the SCC and actually had some real outstanding performances. Uh, so I'm expecting more of the same. Uh, Terra still, of course, a very good god. Uh, maybe not quite as popular, but we actually saw a lot of uh, supports invading uh, in the SCC this morning in EU, and uh, glad to see there uh, Hammy responding correctly to Gamma and uh, not giving away anything cheaply. Yeah, just putting Baby in the corner and making sure that Gamma can't get too <laughs> close to potentially steal that, but supports invading is very real right now. It's pretty effective. There's not a whole lot you can do about it, but it's not the same kind of invade that we used to see when it was you pick Hercules and you just walk down the enemy purple buff level one. It's much more level two, level three. You'll see Gamma likely go to invade those back camps if they don't have Jingaru or somebody there on the cooldown timer. And there's not a lot of risk associated with invading the second purple buff. And that's specifically because that's when the blue buff is spawning on the right-hand side of the map. Most solo laners will probably be pretty vocal if you don't give oh, them the no. chance to get that buff. Aqua pushed into the tower oh. and slammed down by Snatty on the tier. Yeah, absolutely pancake there for second blood in this game. Bit of a brawl going on the left hand side. Actually, Supernova gets used there by Wowie. Jengaru is lurking on this left hand side, and I don't think the Vux have any idea whatsoever. But when will they pull the trigger? Uh, whole Hammy with the blink uh -oh. forward doesn't connect though with Wowie. When does Jengaru make their move? It is now, and Gamma gets pushed back into oh, even more danger, tough. locked in to the Sanctified Fields, and gets fired down upon Jengaru. Picks up this third kill of the game, two kills to one in favor of the Sages. A totem dip, man. Like, honestly, if you have mana for Gamma there, then you can just use any of your, well, not any, you can use two of your three abilities that are available to you, and you probably don't die there, question mark on that one because they did use the Oleron ult, but would have made him immune to the knockback from the Nike. We're all down to Aquarius dying over on that right-hand side. Sam for soccer forced to use the Purification Beast to retreat from Jengaru and Nehu. And uh, it, it seems to be the, the, the flavor of the month with this mid lane is you pair a mid lane assassin with an in-your-face jungler. And I don't know, man, it's it's just nightmare scenarios all the time. It, it feels like you're constantly under threat when you are anywhere near the mid lane of a team that's winning. I love it because it has been entirely too long with these mid laners picking something that just stands there and watches the rest of their team play the game and just kind of rides the coattails of the rest of the team. And that's not a shot at any particular mid laner. That's just been how mid is played. You pick late game scaling mage and then we see you in 20 minutes when you're full build. And finally, we've shifted the meta toward the mid camps are so important these green buff invades these purple buff red buff invades are so critical locking down these side camps the shield buff and the cooldown buff are so critical to what the meta is dictating right now that you finally have to play something like set pele a hunter in mid lane a mage in mid lane that fights early so you can actually get involved earlier on and Fasaka wants to get involved in this duo scrap, but doesn't connect with the Tectonic Rift, and that shall be that for the gank so far. Not too much activity from the junglers. We did see Jengaru on the left-hand side, of course, have an impact. Rather than that, Sam Fasaka, I don't actually believe, has used the Anvil of Dawn yet. And that's okay on the Thor. You're not looking to get so active so early on anymore. It's not quite a necessity, especially with mid lane being so, so volatile and the dual lane being quite so safe. So, you know, a, a reasonable pace from both sides. It's actually the Valhalla Valkyries, though, getting the slight edge in gold lead despite being down in kills. Where, where do you think all that farm might be coming from? I'm not sure, but I do know that the Valkyries are putting that sh farm toward the left side of the map. If you take a look at the jungle over there, you can see all that red vision around the back camps, indicating the fact that the Valkyries want to play around invading those backs, making sure that they can have personnel at the purple buff if they need it. 
and also giving them the best opportunity to walk over and grab that shield buff. Where it's coming from is probably somewhere around the solo lane could be an issue, but the mid lane is likely where they're getting a lot of that farm. It's a one level lead for Krim in the mid Ooh. lane. And Snatty is dying. <laughs> Snatty is straight up just dying to Aquarius. Wow. Of course, Snatty earlier got the 1v1 victory, but this time the Berserker Shield online for Aquarius and the Golden Gooseberries, of course, means that you cannot hide safely in those minion waves anymore. It's that uh, that solo lane is actually relatively volatile at the moment. Not something that's particularly common at the moment, but this green buff being targeted out by the Valhalla Valkyries. However, the response pretty good from the Athenian Sages and nothing to be found over there for the time being. So we're at a somewhat of a stalemate. We do have this Gold Fury on the map and available to be taken uh, if, if any side deems it worthy. But of these two compositions which would you say is most likely uh to be making an early move at this gold fury i think that the athenian sages are the likely uh culprits if it were to be stolen away and what i mean by that is just <laughs> attempting to grab it before anybody shows up the burn that they have is incredible between the oleran ult and the set ult if they choose to invest that if it gets left unawares for too long then the Athenian Sages certainly can look to pull that one away. But again, this the Iron Curtain of Red Wards on the bottom side of the map in duo lane is probably not going to let them do that anytime soon, Judas, because the Valkyries are maintaining a stranglehold of the vision on the left side of the map. So if anybody, despite the fact that their burn is still not bad, but maybe not quite as good as what the Athenian Sages have, it's likely to be the Valhalla Valkyries that would be the ones forcing the issue or at least using their ward coverage, using their information on the map to potentially try to get one of those gold furies Ooh. early on. Aquarius in some trouble. Jengaru leaps from behind. There is the Sentinel of Zeus coming through. Aquarius being so slowed. Gets a little bit of a shield. Here comes the Rand. Finds, finds one, finds two, doesn't find the third. Oh. And Aquarius shall dash on out of there. It seems so certain. The Athenian Sage is not able to lock down this amount of rats in the mid lane. They who forced into the beads get double tapped by Sam Fasaka, but will survive for a moment. Hammy now. A big rotation hit the duo. Gamma with a perfect wall. Locks them in, but Jengaru is here to support the support. Another great tectonic rift. Jengaru has to leap away. Another small health bar. For the Valhalla Valkyries to leave, and they have had enough. And Erupt Crimson shall dive in with the Volcanic Lightning and finally pick up one of these kills. Gold Fury's exposed. Not sure if they're going to go for it, though. Going back on to Nehu, who's teleporting out yet again. That poke is pretty relevant, though. That's half of Nehu's health bar gone. You can see the Valkyries beginning to swarm around the objective. They know they've got a window with Hammy coming back from base and Nehu already half HP. They're going to try for it. Riff is here, fully aware. Are the Athenian Sages? Nehu looping around the backside, 50% HP on the Gold Fury. Nehu not spotted, completely unawares. Are the Valkyries? The wall goes up. Oh wow, the the objective just obliterated there. Now Nehu diving in deep on the left hand side. Uh, coming in is the cavalry catching out Erupt Crimson, but that's a nice purification beast. Good knock up though. The sanctified fields get small, small, slow, and the skewer shall secure the kill. And that will be all that the Athenian Sages can pick up though. So it's still worthwhile trade for the valkyries and that's a very big start for them they do lose crimson but they at least managed to transition some of the aggression that they've had in mid and some of the pressure that they've been getting particularly on nehu and around these back camps into something a little bit more meaningful oftentimes it can be difficult to transition a small lead to get to a bigger lead but they might be going for it in duo here looks like sam for soccer looking for the ult gonna land on Griff. Oh. Right on top of Griff, an immediate purification beads, but Wowie gets a great angle in. Griff is just a sitting duck, will finally fall down. It is Gamma who picks up the kill, however. Maybe not the one you want, but at least the kill goes down. And finally, we actually see some activity from Sam for Soccer. I think that might actually be the first Anvil of Dawn used. Uh, po mostly being poking and prodding in the mid lane to some effect, and finally turn that into a decent fight. Yeah, and that's the beads forced off of Griff as well, so we won't have those for another two minutes or so, and 30% cooldown already available for Sam for Soccer means that if they want to try to abuse that cooldown, again, they have, or at least they had, I think that a lot of it probably expired at this point, very good vision around the duo lane, 
They could go for it. They're going to have to contend with two sentry wards. But first, we're going to fight over this beacon. Of course, the, the ad inaugural fight over the beacon in this game. Now, Gamma finds himself cut off. Nice double tap. Going up from San Fasaka. It is very close to full on the red side, but there are multiple members of the Athenian Sages. Snatty goes in with a fearless, doesn't connect with Gamma. A virtue of the knockup immunity is a scrap going on Sam. in this mid lane. A rough crimson low. Sam Fasaka's in the air. Snatty up downs in place, has to give up the beacon. Snatty is low, but will retreat back to safety. Sanctified fields. What are you doing? Downtown, right out wide, but Griff is all alone. Can't connect with enough damage onto anyone. And that is the first beacon. Going the way of the Valkyries. And it came off of, uh, well, it didn't come off of, but it was followed by a very weird disconnect there from Griff, who burns the Sanctified Field, as you mentioned. But after the fight was over, for the most part, I mean, everybody's already backed up. He was standing on that flank for quite some time, and it looked like he might have had a chance, had a time, had an opportunity to go in, but waits until the fight is basically over to expend that one. I'm not sure if they... Might have been looking to catch somebody unawares with that or thought that something was there that wasn't, but just one more defensive tool taken away from this Olaran who, getting about a half level, call it a level maybe, behind the soul. It's nothing to write home about yet, Judas, but it is one to keep an eye on because if Wowie can kind of shove that in a little bit harder, develop that lead a little bit more, we could be getting some early rotations to the right-hand side of the map. Don't forget that both of these teams, as mentioned before, have very good burn on these objectives. And if somebody decides to stick it, Judas, things are going to get chaotic. Because we don't have the... There are no mages in the middle lane, right? So we don't have yep. that big instance of secure. And it's not even a Susano in the mid lane for a Typhoon to maybe knock down an objective. It's going to get messy. Everybody is going to die around these objectives if they all in commit to them. That might be pretty good reason to take things a little bit slower if you're the Valkyries here. We've got about a 3,000 gold lead now. Maybe don't want to start swinging that around too much for fear of maybe the pendulum swinging back in the opposite direction. Yeah, it's a tough call for what exactly the best secure on the map might be. Uh, very often, previously, we've seen the Supernova coming out from Wowie to be a considerably good objective secure, but it's it's not that singular burst of damage. It's several little ticks of damage. You know, almost why we see the Dharmic Pillars come out from Ganesh, steal a lot of objectives. It's just because if you're going to you know, make it a bit of a 50-50, if you're flipping coins more often, you're more likely to get the landing that you want. But... In general, there's, there's really not a lot of secure, so it will be a brawl over these objectives. Nehu, not sure they were totally surprised by that, but did manage to loop around and get out safely. Pyromancer still stands strong, as does the Oni Fury on the left-hand side. And it's all about who wants to make the brave call and pull this objective. And I'm taking a look at these builds, Judas, because we've been seeing the advent of Breastplate meta, is probably what I would use to call it. Just about everybody has been building Breastplate of Determination, and hang on, Sages, I think that they got a moment. Aqua's here, though, for the Pyromancer. Oh, Aqua in with the Dazzling Offensive, actually putting out a lot of damage, but Sam for soccer finds the target they want, but actually, no, changing target now to Nehu. This damage is very widespread, and no one target actually being locked down just yet for the Valkyries. Maybe it's just to deflect the Athenian Sages away from this objective, as now the Chaos side will be the ones pulling it. A Wowie is there, Snatty behind them, blinking forward, is erupt Crimson, but in some danger, has to retreat because the damage is high! Coming out from Griff, but the Pyromancer does go the way of the Valkyries, I believe, and that will be the first Runic Bomb picked up by Aquarius. It was a big scrap in the mid lane, but overall, the Valks come out on top. Yeah, Valks kinda squeak by with that one, and now actually chasing down the left-hand side. They do have to be a little bit careful here. Sanctified Field was not expended in that team fight around the Pyromancer, so that could be an opportunity for a re-engage or maybe even sneaking away at the Zoni Fury, but looks like with Wowie over here to play defense and the Athenian Sages going back to farming the map, not likely to be what we end up seeing. So for all the for all the bluster I put on the front end, Judas, for how all of these objective fights were going to get so messy and chaotic, get actually turned out pretty calm. I mean, Erupt Crimson has to use the Volcanic Lightning to disengage and barely gets out with one HP under the tower. Snatty dunks into the Pyromancer, doesn't quite manage to steal that one away. But once the objective is done, I mean, everybody barely comfortable just backing up and resetting for the next engagement. 
It is a Pyromancer Bomb to the Valkyries, which could come into play later. That one does go on to Aquarius, so could be an opportunity for maybe some split pushing or an unexpected secure, which does have, again, a lot of value in this style of game where no one singular instance of damage is the true trump card around these objectives. It's going to be a bit of a toss-up. Aqua now has by far the single largest instance of damage for these objectives if they do look to pull it. Well, the objective that you can't use an instance of damage on is this beacon, which is now available, and the Valkyries taking up first position. Now Hammy dashing deep, Snaddy still occupying the zone. Gets stunned out and actually sundered by Gamma there, so will retreat for the time being. Aquarius pushing down this mid lane. Snaddy going all the way forward with the Judgment, but not actually connecting with the stun. Doesn't connect with the Fearless either. Gamma pushed out. The zone is free. The Valkyries want to take it and shall secure it. Now Jengaru, low health, has to retreat from the Supernova, but Sanfasaka goes to the sky. Jengaru is a sitting duck and gets killed off. Sanctified Fields, though, will look to punish, and that's a huge knock-up with the combination. And Hammy also dragging in Aquarius in deep. Gets knocked up, gets killed off. Runic Bomb actually lifting Snatty up and Erupt Crimson diving deep. Wow. Now he pushing forward as well. It was looking good for the Sages, but the Valhalla Valkyries find four and come out on top. And there's your chaotic team fight around the objective. Absolutely. We didn't think it would be a beacon necessarily, but definitely got messy there toward the end. It was a great sanctified field for the re-engage for the Athenian Sages. Griff picks a perfect opportunity to use that one just as they push Gamma back into it very deep into that tower. Sam for Soccer got caught in one of the knockups. I mean, you can you can take your guess which one it was because the <laughs> Sages have plenty of them, but unfortunately, the initial engage was... Oh! thought that he might have gotten that one, but Valkyries <laughs> do secure. The initial engage, Judas, from the Valkyries just took too much of the health bars from the Sages. Jangara had to burn the ult, jump away very early on, and the dive was deep, yes, and it was into an Oleron ult, yes, but when you're putting out that much damage before, you have to take your quote unquote true team fight underneath the objective in the Olorenult, it's still not the end of the world. I mean, most of these characters are building some kind of hybrid itemization anyway. It's really yeah. only Sam for Soccer that doesn't have at least one defense item. Even Wowie's going to be getting that oh so crucial breastplate of determination, even in the soul build, meaning that the time to kill is going to be increased on just about everybody in the lobby, except for maybe Sam for Soccer. Everybody else has something to keep them alive, something to make that burst damage a little bit less impressive, which could mean that these team fights could be a little bit longer and less decisive as we drag on into this game a little bit longer. Well, while we're talking about fashionable builds, I've spotted something spicy coming out from Jangaru here. That is an Archdruid's Fury being picked up uh, by the Nike, and I, I respect it. I think we've seen this item come out a couple of times. I think we saw... Uh, in, in on a Cerberus recently as well, playing in solo lane. Uh, but is this what Jengaru needs? It, it, the, the Nike seems to have struggled so far. Picking up this item, maybe helping them with a bit of survivability and a bit of damage. It might, but we'll talk in a second. Snaddy's going in here. Blink also in from Hammy, but Sam's in the air. Sam's in the air. Where will they land? I don't even see it because it's Griff way in the backside. Already taken down at the start of this fight. Now Nehu trying to get the revenge pick, but that is he beads enemy on. There's a tomb for safety and Jengaru in some trouble. Hammy falls down early. That is Snaddy gets a triple knockup with a defensive fearless, but just running away on retreat. Gets a fearless in response, but not enough. Another three kills for the Valhalla Valkyries. Now they turn their attention not to the Pyromancer, but to the big fire giant. And a little overzealous there from the Sages, who very clearly wanted to stake their claim on that Pyromancer fight and not give up another bomb. If you remember, the first one was used under the Tier 1 tower, but now we're 20 minutes in, and that could be used to secure a Fire Giant, or if FG goes down, could be used for potential Phoenix Siege. The value of the Pyromancer and the bomb that you get as a result of it goes up as the game goes along. And obviously the Sages thought that where they were at in their builds, they had a couple of spikes going on in particular, that Arc Druid's Fury that you mentioned just finished, as did the Stone of Binding as well for Hammy, who could have had a second Relic upgrade at that point. 
it could have been a good opportunity for them, but they just jump in a little bit too soon. Griff wasn't quite there. 15 seconds, if I'm not mistaken, on both of the relics for Griff, which is the reason that Sam was able to so cleanly kill him and get on out of there. And once your main team fight ult is down in the Sanctified Field, it's already a bad fight for the Athenian Sages. So credit to the Valkyries for understanding their window of opportunity, even when it looked like the Sages were opening one of their own. Well, where can the Sages find their next window is the all-important question, because now it is a sizable gold lead. That is almost yep. 10,000 gold only 23 minutes in, you know, that that is a huge lead. I know that the Valhalla Valkyries have already taken one fire giant, but this is the first fire giant. This is when you're supposed to be making your initial push for these tier two towers, but the tier two towers are already pretty much gone. There is uh, a lot of exposed phoenixes here, and the Valhalla Valkyries have a ton of the map to play with, so it's really up to them where the next engagement takes place. And it looks like the Valkyries want to grab this last tier 2 tower. I think it's smart from the Sages to understand that they have much bigger things to contend with than just trying to defend this tier 2. You hear a lot about a soft defense where you step up, try to slow them down even by just a couple of seconds and then back up under the bird. No such luck here for the Sages. They want to make sure Griff's positioning is very safe, doesn't get caught out by any of the instantaneous crowd control things like the Sam for soccer wall, things like Gamma with that clap from a distance could force him to use the beads early, and that could be catastrophic for the Athenian Sages. They really need to get one all-in fight, Judas. They don't have a, a, a poke-style composition. There's no Thoth in the middle lane. Nehu's on the set, and you got Griff on the Olara, which means that you want a sanctified fields and then drop the Kingslayer right in the center of all that's going on, and maybe slow everybody around with the Jangar roll as well. So it's going to be one big opportunity from the Athenian Sages if they want to try to stake their claim on the defense here. I think you should be trying to defend the birds here because it only gets worse for you if you don't. But it's going to be a bit of a tall task with all of the Valkyries already poking Jengar to half. Jengar to half, mid-Titan, uh, mid-Phoenix already gone, despite that being the lane where the Titans walk down. But why are we now locked down by Snatty and Hammy? Can they find any more with it, though? It's just this left side Phoenix putting up any sort of a defense. And there's Griff getting caught again. BJ just very late. And the Mjolnir's attunement will seal the deal. Sam for Sokka now retreating because the Volcanic Lightning comes in from her up. Crimson Hammy gets shut down while we're running them down. Snaddy now trying to deal with whatever they can back. But the damage is just so high from this soul. There are three members down by the Athenian Sages. And the Titan is, thankfully for them, pushing out of the base so the game will not end. But at the moment, the Valhalla Valkyries are going to get an early push on this Titan, and the Chaos Titan is also running down this mid lane. There's a real chance they can go for this anyway, Judas. It's 15 seconds on a bunch of different members. They've still got five people with FG. It looks like they want to at least contend with the idea of trying it. Nehu, Minion no wave. ult available. It's going to be tough. Our minions are in, which means the protections are reduced. The damage is coming through from Jengaru. Nehu slamming back. The Titan is falling so quickly, though. No hesitation from the Valhalla Valkyries. They make the decision. They commit to the decision. And they take down that Titan. 25 minutes, the game timer. It didn't look to be easy at first, but at the end, looked pretty clean. No, I mean, not bad at all. And junglers at home, take notes. If you're wondering, how do I play against the Olaren? Well, there's your answer. Sam for Soccer says just kill him before he uses the ult. Because I'm pretty sure that Griff didn't use Sanctified Fields in any of the last, right. definitely two fights, but maybe even the last three fights that we saw there toward the end. He got erased through both relics in that left Phoenix Siege. And even before that, Sam sets up that middle Phoenix break-in by getting a good wall over the wall onto... Um, excuse me, onto the Nike there and make sure the Jingaru had to back up to base and forfeit that middle bird. Breaking into the base the first time is always the most difficult thing that you can do in the game of Spite. Yep. It's very well orchestrated, well designed around the map such that de the defensive team is always favored with all three Phoenixes up. But once you get that all critical first bird down, your job becomes a lot easier. And I think that the Sages did a great job of, you know, hanging on for as long as they could in the face of adversity but the valkyries looked clinical in that game clinical from the valkyries what can the sages do to recover let's find out after we take a short break and come back for game number two <laughs>
And we are back, everybody. Welcome in for Athenian Sages versus the Valhalla Valkyries, part two of this set. Ah, oh, I missed that. Hold on. Here we go. Part two. That's the one. Uh, I'll get there eventually. But yeah, it was a clinical game from the Valhalla Valkyries. It was relatively even for the first 15 minutes or so. And then it just exploded come objective time. It did. And that was kind of how we drew that one up is it was going to get pretty chaotic around the objectives. But typically when I think chaos, Judas, I think going both ways, right? Like I'm talking three for four, four for four in a lot of the fights, but most of them were pretty decisive. And I do think that a lot of that was due to the fact that Sam Prasakar kind of had Griff in the corner the entire game. Didn't really do a whole lot. We actually talked very early on. I think you mentioned that didn't feel like Sam for Soccer used the Anvil of Dawn for quite some time in that game. Yeah. Didn't see a whole lot of payoff from the 30% cooldown that he rushed early on. But once we got to the team fight stage of the game where whether or not players are alive is a whole lot more important, Sam definitely kept him down and prevented the Sanctified Field from becoming an issue because otherwise they had decent tools to deal with that cooldown but didn't have the best tools possible to make sure that they didn't get a whole lot of value out of it. So credit to Sam. And I think that if you're going to be taking Thor away from one dude, it might be Sam for soccer. Let's see what tools both teams elect to have as we head on into game number two, picks and bands. And something that is very, very worth noting, Kaizo, is that that Oleron pick, which suffered so heavily at the hands of Sam Fusaka, was actually the top pick mm -hmm. by the Athenian Sages, and they have elected to go for our first pick yet again. Now, we've seen the strength that Oleron can have, and it's not that Oleron is bad, it's not that Gamma did particularly poorly i think i think you know just given the circumstances sometimes the game goes that way would you consider top picking the ola run again into the valhalla valkyries i would argue yes every single time because you can't uh it's it's called results-based thinking because you're basically just looking only at what happened after the game is over and then yeah. identifying the problem as a result of what happened and i don't think that's what's going on here i think that oleron is a good pick it is worth picking first overall it just had a bad game they didn't do the best job of playing around it he did obviously take that early spill at the hands of wowie which does mean that things weren't great from the start but yeah now that you're also taking away i saw you eyeing that ban at sam for soccer thor taken off the table now the Valkyries are on the clock, and there you go. The Oleron, they know, once we have the Thor unavailable, probably better to just take that one off. Now that does leave Judas. The Freya is still up, as is the Soul, which Wowie again did play in game number one. But instead, it's the Athena that's looked at here. I, You know how Athena. I feel about Athena, so I'm always happy to see this one locked in. Yeah, Athena just so strong, and of course, I, I've seen it referenced a few times now that if Chernobog is off the map... Uh, and you have an Athena, it's it's just the perfect way to use a global. Uh, it, having the global, which is one of the better globals in the game, of course, uh, and the other team just not having access to one, uh, it's it's just a huge advantage to have because we're not seeing not any Apollo person. right now. Uh, so nothing can really contend with the global presence. But Pele Freya, it's very similar to the Pele Amaterasu pickup. It, it, it's just a strong pairing to go for the Valks here. Yeah, these are two very good gods to be top picking. And Krim looked fine on the Pele. I didn't think it was earth shattering the performance that he had, but he did everything that a Pele mid needed to do in that game. And obviously Freya, as we talked about in game number one, same sort of conversation in the dual lane as the Oleron. Maybe doesn't do it quite as well, but probably one tier above just about any other ADC that you could pick over there. And Soul was available for the Sages, and typically teams will look to grab that one if they don't have the Oleron available, just match the Magical ADC pressure with another Magical ADC. But instead, they elect to go for the Kamazots and Daji, so favoring something to dive the, the Freya once we come to the team fight stage versus something to match her in the laning phase. Does mean that the Valks get to ban this Soul, though, and that's going to make the life of Renjiru a little bit more difficult. He's going to have to find an Onher, a Kurninos, an Ishtar, something that can help him contend against the Valkyrie's dual lane. It's not going to be the Heimdall, so it's going to be interesting to see how deep into the pockets Renjiru is going to go here. Interesting to see the uh, Geb lock-in coming through from the Valks as well. Geb is a god that, uh, A, is complete opposite to the playstyle we saw Gamma 
take in the previous game, but also a card we haven't seen too often. But it does do quite well into the Athena, but also into Daji. Now, Daji and Kamazot's pairing from the Sage is an interesting one, because these are two assassins that do completely different things. Uh, they're almost entirely different in style, and I presume this will be a Kamazot's being sent to the mid lane. Uh, yep. Could also be in the solo lane at this point, but Daji absolutely cannot go for that. Uh, but I would expect to see maybe a little bit more beads burn potential from the Athenian Sages. Daji and Athena, maybe not enough. Cerberus, however, if that is locked in, absolutely would be enough. And with the Hercules oh, hey, being picked up by the Valks too, I think this is a great game for Cerberus to shine in. I think that the Serb looks good here. The Jingwei is... If you can harken back to the last time that Freya was meta, Jingwei was pretty commonplace at that time, and Crit was in the meta then. And the idea is that Freya oh, likes to abuse the enemy ADC by banishing them and then running them down with the Hasten Ring. And once you get banished as Jingwei, you can just dive on out of there, you can use the movement ability even while airborne, and prevent her from abusing you quite as much. Crit is in the meta right now as well. It's fair. Wow, Loki locked in here. Crit is still pretty good right now and gives her an opportunity to potentially fight back in, but that does mean that the Sages are all but sacrificing their left side of the map for probably the first 15, maybe 20 minutes until Renjiru starts to get some of that crit online. Based on the way that the Valks played game number one around the Gold Fury very early on, they had so much ward coverage and pressure around the shield buffs, a little bit worried for what the Sages are going to be doing to contend with some of that pressure. Well, we'll see exactly how the Sages contend with that pressure as we head on in to game number two. And uh, like you mentioned, it might be difficult uh, for Griffin and Hammy on this left-hand side of the map to contend with Wowie on this Freya. Because we've uh, kind of touched on Freya a lot of times being considered a late-game hyper carry because obviously that is what Freya does. However, in these days... Freya is also very good early game too, especially into a pick like Jingwei, who really does not exude a lot of pressure themselves. This might be a, a really, really tough uh, duo lane for the Sages if they let it get out of control at all. This needs to be very tightly played so that they can allow Jengaru and Nehu to have this impact that the Daiji Kamazots is capable of having. If you are the Sages and you are attempting to play into the left-hand side of the map with the picks that you've selected, I think that it's generally a bad call. I think that you are outright out-pressured in dual lane. You don't really get the opportunity to fight. Again, Griff is going to be going for You can see the Gilded Arrow here as the starter item. So it's going to be a late-game crit build that won't come online for quite some time. Whereas Wowie needs one item. He needs Telkine's Ring and maybe hasten ring you could argue necessary as well and then he has dominance of the entire left side of the map i think that the sages are much more likely to play around the mid lane maybe try to do something in the solo lane but hercules reasonably safe over there against something like the cerberus not a whole lot of pressure to really work with over there Finding a target for where you're going to be playing the early game is going to be difficult for the Sages. It feels almost to me like they're just going to try to hang on in the early game and then transition some of that double jing, or uh, excuse me, double the double tongue tied here, double assassin. I'll speak a little bit slower, it'll be fine. Yeah, get Dual it out. lane Let's pressure it over there and then try to shut down while we once he's already online. It's just a matter of if they can get there, Judas. That's going to be the big question for this one. Yeah, one thing uh, I am curious about is what Hammy will do uh, to deal with this gap. Uh, you know, decent poke coming up there from San Fosaka. But the, the, the job for Gamma is very simple. You shield whoever gets taunted. Which makes the job for Hammy much more difficult because you need to get a taunt onto someone you want to kill and also Gamma. And that is much more easily said than done. Uh, it can be tough to uh, catch Geb unawares and and of course nearby an easy target so it, it's going to be interesting to see how hammy can play this athena of course having that global rotation power will allow them to get involved in places that the geb is not so it's all about can gamma keep up with the uh rotations coming through from hammy but aside from that it will all be around what uh wowie and griff decide to get up to because if they're brawling a bit too much you, again, like you said, will give the room for Wowie to have uh, freedom of the left-hand side of the map. Not a lot. Jengar is going to be able to do about it. 
So they'll have to keep an eye on this mid and solo side uh, for where, where the real action should be taking place in this early stage. It is actually kind of funny the way that characters like Geb work, though, because you have, I think, of a lot of the times Kepri, for me, and Aphrodite also fall in that conversation for backline-style supports that have a very clear idea of what they want to do to really peel for somebody, and like you said, the shield or Aphrodite ult or Kepri ult, whatever the case may be. If it's a very good peel tool that keeps, the, keeps somebody who is a high-value target safe on your team, that makes you the target, actually, as the support. And typically, a good steal there from... Oh, well, I thought that he got it, but Snatty didn't quite get it. It is interesting that somebody like Gamma has to position a little bit more carefully because they know that Crimson's going to want to be shielded away from these taunts as he's diving. Same for Sam for soccer. And that means that Gamma, without that cooldown available, could be the target of a lot of the aggression. Instead of taunting around the Geb, you just go through the Geb and just try to kill him so he can't use the taunt at all. Well, we'll have to see what Griff can do to follow that up. Of course, the uh, crit protection coming up from Gamma, but oh, that's a whoop into a big bit of danger. Oh, fantastic cataclysm there. Locks Hammy in place, but also puts Griff in some danger. That is the first blood going the way of Wowie, and second blood almost for Sam for Saka, but Griff under a world of pressure now. That is exactly how you want to play this duo and jungle combination for the Valhalla Valkyries. Yeah, and surprising... Probably no one at this point. The Valkyries play around the dual lane. That is where they are strongest at this stage of the game. And get an early kill onto Hammy. It is very worth noting that they didn't bring down Griff there. He uses the beads but does manage to live as Krim potentially looks to go aggressive here. Has Jengaru coming in. Gamma's there, but oh. the burst damage is insane! Burst damage absolutely outstanding. All of the bleed, all of the claws coming through from Jengaro and all of the range damage from Nehu to contribute to that just shuts down Erupt Crimson. And that was with Gamma nearby. Uh, so <laughs> nothing really doing there for the Gab. Not able to save their first target, but it's confidence for the Athenian Sages. I think you need a decent start like that elsewhere if your dual lane is going to fall down early yet again. And this was the plan the whole time. Well, hang on. Sam for Soccer oh, taking man. a 1v1 here with Jangaro. I don't think you win ah. this one, buddy. And Sam for Soccer will clean that one up. Nehu is around. One shot off the mark. Second one, definitely be getting the job done there for the Sages. So they do answer back. But that is definitely the game plan here for the Sages. You don't want to be playing around the dual lane. You want to let Griff kind of just take the beating over there. Try to steal away a shield buff, if at all possible. And if Wowie gets too aggressive, then maybe you expend the Athena ult. But more likely than not, it's going to be a lot of what you just saw on your screen. It's going to be Wowie harassing this Jingwei, forcing the Jingwei ult as often as possible, and just having that entire side of the map locked down. It's going to be on the Sages to play around the mid lane. They've broken in pretty well now that they've gotten a kill off onto Erupt Crimson as well as Sam for Soccer. Got to find some way to continue to roll that pressure onward. If that's contesting the mid camps, if that's invading a red buff or some green buffs along the way, need some way to pay off on that pressure. Oh, purple buff abducted, and that is a fantastic knockback to save the life of Hammy. But the purple buff does go the way of the Valhalla Valkyries. Another good invade on this left hand side. Sam for soccer nearby as well, because Griff has no airstrike available, no purification beads either, and the assassinate is ready, waiting in the wings. Now, Jangaro is fully aware that there is a potential attempt on the life of Griff. Maybe not quite so aware of how close Sam for Saka is, who's edging forward. Now leaps in with the assassinate. There's an immediate defender of Olympus in response. Griff just about survives, and Sam for Saka does not. Jengaru goes up into the parallel, gets a pluck onto Wowie. Pulls them into some danger. Gamma might be in some more danger. There's the Thousand Claws coming through and jumping in with the Trickster Spirit, but does it get the final hit? Yes, they can with the bleed, but that is Wowie. Get the return shots in up into the sky, and down goes Griff too. Far too, but I think overall the Valhalla Valkyries are happy with that trade. Yeah, Valkyries are very pleased with the way that one went. Oh, man. 1v1 here. Krim has no mana whatsoever, but wants to take it with Nehu. And buddy, you don't have the resource. You don't got the vitamins for that 1v1. We'll certainly <laughs> be falling in short order. So it's another kill now onto this Pele. Once again, opening this door, but once again, reinforcing the fact, Judas, that 
even when they get the optimal engage there, Jangaru completely baits Sam for soccer, knowing full well that that gank was coming in and that they had the Athena ult also at the ready. They still can't fight over there. I mean, they tried their best. They took what was their best engagement. Ooh. And Wowie still gets three kills. Oh, fantastic dash there after the Trickster Spirit from Aquarius. And that's it. Jengaru can do no more because the cavalry has arrived. Great stun from Snatty. That's a good assassinate as well. Does not get the knockup, does Aquarius. So a bit more brawling back and forth. These solo laners absolutely going at it tooth and nail. No more to be had just yet. Blue buff spawned on the right-hand side. So that's why all the attention is being paid over here. It's been an action-packed game so far. Nine kills for both teams and not even nine minutes in just yet. Aqua taking a lot of damage here. Jangara will not get credit for that one. It'll actually be snatty, but blue buff successfully invaded here for the Athenian Sages. And this is the, the manifestation of their game plan. Griff is now two levels behind. You knew that Griff was going to be down. You didn't think it was going to be this bad. But you knew that you had to find value other places on the map. And it looks like it might be mid lane that they're trying for right now. They got that green buff invade. Hammy will make it out of there. Gonna draw that one out just in case. But they're clearly <laughs> looking other places, Judas. I think that a big mistake a lot of teams make at all levels of play, but in particular right below the SCC level, is trying to play around the losing lane. It feels like you should be attempting to shut down Wowie to get yourself back into the game, contending these early gold theories, attempting to st essentially staunch the bleeding on that side of the map. And more often than not, that is the wrong call. You should just let Wowie be two levels ahead and try to find something elsewhere. And they get very good value in the middle lane. They'll actually get another oh. kill onto Gamma here. Wow. And they've got, also got that good value in the right lane. Not only the kill onto Aqua, but also that blue buff invade. It's not going to make things easier for Griff, but by God, is it going to make the rest of the team of the Athenian Sages a little bit more comfortable in this one? Yeah, with the mid uh, lane going quite so well for the Sages, also the jungle, and, you know, somewhat the right-hand side of the map. Solo lane's a bit of a stalemate, but I think overall the Sages will be happy with it. Aquarius gets lifted by that Stygian Torment. Will not be able to find any more, though. Going in is Jengaru, gets the Trickster Spirit, and a couple of chains with the Parallel, pulls Aquarius back in, who just heals it all right back up with the Mitigate Wounds. But now the re-engage from Hammy comes through. Earthbreaker cannot get the pull onto anyone. Now Sam for soccer looking for their target in Jengaru. Cannot engage properly, so that will be that for the time being. The Pyromancer is on the way, but not yet arrived at their destination, so there's no real objective on this right-hand side. Surely the Fire Giant just too strong for anyone to go for at this stage. Uh -oh. But, oh, Sam for soccer catches out. Nehu, and with the combination with Erupt Crimson as well, erupting into the Volcanic Lightning, that's a cheap pick for the Valkyries to pick up. And that's well-timed also, because, well, hang on, Erupt Crimson gets taunted in here. Jangar is on the scene. There's the knockup from Krim, but he's got to get out of there fast. It's a proper fight for Jengaru, but they can't find any more damage. Earth Shield comes through. Nice immunity on the knockup. The decoy will lock Jengaru in for a little bit longer. Gamma wants this, as does Erupt Crimson, and gets the Pyroclast at long range as well. Hammy now, also falling very, very low, gets caught in the decoy, and that will be all of the tick damage that Sampha Sokka needs. Seven kills to seven. The Valhalla Valkyries strike back massively. And again, at a very crucial moment in the game, because Nehu had the ult available in probably less than 10 seconds. And if Sam for Soccer goes for that play once that Kamazot's ultimate is online, they never get that kill. And then they never get the follow-up kills afterward. But despite the fact that Nehu was still level 12 at the time, he had the opportunity to back and grab those beads Hadn't quite picked those up yet, so no CC immunity means that both of those assassins can just blow him up before he can react to it. And then that's only the start to the waterfall. And don't forget, this is where the Sages were supposed to be at their strongest. They had 3-0 and o Kamazots in the middle lane. They knew that dual lane was already a bad spot to fight, so they were trying to go anywhere else. Now the Valkyries have broken their way into the one place oh, that the Valkyries God. felt safe. 
Oh man, that is Griff being absolutely blown up by a Wowie. Now Hammy in a lot of danger as well. Will they be able to get the dash on out? It doesn't look like it because insane. Wowie is Disgusting. just firing off Gross. these shots. Absolutely insane, like you say. Freya Vile. just going nuts right now. And uh, not a lot that the Sage is going to be able to do about it over there. Can they take down Aquarius as a counter punch? There's a Stygian Torment coming through, but that will be... Enough to get the kill onto Aquarius with the Paolo. They do counter on the other side of the map, but this Freya has to be stopped at some point. Maybe, question mark. Like, what are you going to do to this Freya at this stage of the game? Because you're not rotating over there to kill her. Look at the deep vision that the Valkyries have. If anybody even thinks for a moment about crossing over to the dual lane side of the map, then the Valkyries will already have that information ready and available to them. It's really got to come from the team fight stage, and it's already looking somewhat grim as Nehu gets the beads forced there by the assassinate from Sam for soccer. Athena ult also expended just as this primal fury is due to spawn. And wouldn't you know it, Judas, Freya is on the primal fury side of the map by default. So I think that the Valkyries are likely to turn their attention there sooner rather than later, while Nehu is still missing some of those critical cooldowns. Because Wowie's already going to be up here regardless. I mean, he's going to be trying to prevent Griff from farming as much as possible, invading some of this farm if he all gets the opportunity to do so. It's just a matter of how many people do they need on vision before they can go for this pick. Snatty makes the big rotation to the mid lane, as does Aquarius on this Hercules. Nice push, actually. They're coming through, so and some danger is Nay, who now goes up into the bat out of hell already. Aquarius takes some damage. Oh, Stygian Torment on the three. Only will pull the one, but it might be the one that they need. Jumping back in is Snatty. Hammy is there as well. It's all five in the mid lane for the Valhalla Valkyries, but Jengaru picks up the all-important first kill. Goes for the Palo, pulls in two key targets. will have to retreat themselves. Primal Fury is still left exposed, but the key thing for the Sages here is they have won this fight in a four versus five scenario because uh, Griff over on the left-hand side free to get all the farm that they needed. And the Valhalla Valkyries don't feel confident enough to pull this Gold Fury just yet. Nevertheless, the Athenian Sage is looking at this Pyromancer instead. Sages are 1v2 over there on the Pyro side of the map, but hang on, this might be a great opportunity for the Sages on left. Oh! Jingwei Ultimate used. Wow, he's up in the air. Airstrike comes through, Snatty goes to dive deep, Griff covers the option, although that's fantastic, Whoop coming through, can Griff find the 1v1, it is a great Aegis amulet as well, and yes, Griff Huge. gets the all-important shutdown, Sanfa Saka in some danger from Snatty, surely someone shall go down, Snatty giving chase, there's the defender of Olympus on top, Hammy will dive deep, will go for the taunt as well, this Pele though, healing up so much, but not enough, Snatty shall shut down, erupt Crimson in the middle lane, now Hammy in a world of danger but the minion waves juggling the tower aggro hammy is still alive <laughs> and does not take enough damage now jengaru sweeping in to pick up some more kills gamma gets triple hit with the palo and gets ticked down snatty back in the fight and there is sam for soccer back in the fight going for a knock up is aquarius goes for the excavate on two the health bars are so low but they are still high enough the athenian sages fight back absolutely extraordinary and Sage's fans break out the pom-poms because not only do you take an overwhelming victory in that team fight, but you also successfully land to kill onto the highest priority target on the map. You finally shut down Wowie and also bring down, if I'm not mistaken, everybody else on the Valkyries yeah. throughout the course of that fight. I don't even remember who got the Gold Fury. I don't even care who got the Gold <laughs> Fury, Judas. Because finally, the Sages have fought their way back in, and they're immediately turning their attention to this Fire Giant. Everybody's just now respawning for the Valkyries. They might get Krim there in time, but close. it's going to be close. Fire Giant's low, and in goes one, but the Athenian Sages get the objective. Nice Cataclysm from Gamma, but they might just seal their own fate. Erupt Crimson also falling low. Snaddy on this Cerberus has been absolutely relentless, and Nehu blinking in gets the catch with the Vampire Bats. Jengaru now diving onto Aquarius. The Hercules shall live no longer. Right side tier two will live no longer. And this Phoenix is under duress as well. The Athenian Sages have exploded to life in this game. 
And they're diving deep here onto Wowie. There's a good taunt. Forces out the beads and the ult. Jangaru hunting him down. Pulls in Sam for soccer. And it'll be the right hand bird going down in favor of the Athenian Sages. I feel like we need to take a breath, Judas, because it's been... It, it felt like a snowball rolling down a hill in favor of the Valkyries. They were favored in yep. almost every lane, except for, you could argue, the solo lane wasn't going so well. Aqua under duress for a large portion of this game. But when your Freya is 5-0, and oh, two levels ahead, and you're already due to reset for a Gold Fury respawn, you would think that things are going well, and things would continue to go well from that point. But the Sages strike at the perfect critical moment. They take that excellent oh 4v5 in the middle lane, shut down some pretty crucial oh. members as Krim takes another spill there in the mid lane. Gamma's going to be short to follow. And it's just been like this for the last wow. two, three minutes, four minutes of this game. The Athenian Sages have completely come to life in this one. And it's all off of one singular team fight. If we can see the graphs one more time, you can see that one team fight in the mid lane that spilled over to the Gold Fury where the Valkyries thought that they had time to grab that objective and run with it. And it was the one mistake that the Sages needed to get back into this game. I think Snatty has been going absolutely insane so far. Hammy gets a good taunt, but Aquarius immunes it out. Jengaru going deep onto Wowie, up into the Powlow again, forces out the Valkyrie's discretion. Mid Phoenix has already fallen. This is a free fight for the Sages to take. Jengaru is getting low. Might be in some danger and shall fall to Earth Crimson, but Gamma also falls again. Nehu actually leaps in, might get punished for a great stun by Snatty. And then the Stygian Torment as well to compete and put Wowie in more danger. Hammy and Nehu swinging on the other side. Wowie falls down. This could be the game, Kaizo. There's a lot of objectives down. Griff is here, has the consistent damage. Aquarius and Sampa Soccer, the only two to defend. Minion Wave makes it in. Airstrike goes aggressive. Hammy is low, but Hammy shall retreat. The Titans half HP. Sampa Soccer will fall down. Snaddy is still churning out the damage onto this Titan, as is everyone else. The respawn comes through from Gamma. Nehu falls down, but the Titan. Titan will also eventually burn down and even faster than the Valhalla Valkyries in game number one. The Athenian Sages take game number two. It, blink and you'll miss it, man, because that was a fast turnaround from the Sages there. And they didn't do anything spectacular either. They just yep. waited for their one opportunity. And the Valkyries made one key mistake. That one singular team fight that they didn't get the payoff for around that Stygian beacon. They got the one pick off onto Aquarius. And then they tried to back up, lick their wounds, do the Gold Fury. And that was the only thing required for the Sages to get back in. They finally shut down the Freya in that engagement, chase it all the way up the lane. And I think that if the Valkyries play it differently, we could be looking at a different landscape of that game. But instead of just resetting, realizing that we maybe overstayed our welcome a little bit, we lose out on some of our lead, they respawn and just conveyor belted themselves into the Athenian Sages and just death after death after death all in a row gave them the crucial opportunity to get back into this game. Credit where it's due to the Sages, because that was looking dire, and they made it look real good in the end. It was always tight, even when uh, the, the lead was going so well for Freya on that left-hand side. It still meant that the gold lead was equalized roughly because of everything else going so well, and it just meant that one big fight, like you said, and it turns it all on its head. But we are one to one in this set so far. How will it end? Let's find out after this short break. <laughs>
All right, everybody, we are back, we are ready, we are hydrated, and we are good to go for game number three between the Athenian Sages and the Valhalla Valkyries. It's been back and forth and not something we often get to see, but two teams are really evenly matched, both having some pretty dominant victories after around the 15-minute mark. I didn't think I was going to need a water break, Judas. I really didn't. But after game number two, if we see anything like that in game three, I think I'm going to need a whole lot more energy for what we've got coming because that's not something you get to see a whole lot in competitive smite anymore. It's a lot of graphs that look like this where they just slowly go down and then the game is over. But we got to see an incredible turnaround there from the Sages. I think that everybody at home who loves Snatty and the rest of those guys is very excited with the way that game went. Taking down, don't forget, one of our best teams that we have to offer here in the SEC. And now one-to-one, -one, we told you this was going to be a good one. And we told you this is some of the best competition we got. And I think these guys are definitely proving that mark. Yeah, right. We'll see how this good competition shall round out in our final draft of the evening as we head on into picks and bands for game number three. And you said it perfectly there, Kaiser, that both of these two squads are up there in some of the best rosters we can have. In fact, the Valhalla Valkyries lineup is almost the same as the one that they entered the play-in tournament with. And a lot of people were surprised that this team didn't make it through. They were absolutely the favorites and I think uh, lost both opportunities. They, they were in the first finals and then the mm -hmm. losers finals as well and actually lost yep. both times and blew everyone's minds. Uh, and I, I do think this team, no matter what happens for the rest of the SCC phase, assuming they do qualify through this whole road to world's path, they could still spell a bit of difficulty for some of the SPL teams coming up too. So 
a lot of a lot of people need to keep an eye on both of these two teams across the Athenian stages. Do lose Jengaru after this game, which is a big loss for them. But still, the rest of the team has been playing so fantastically. Not even sure it's going to be that big of a loss. I'm sure they can find a good replacement. As we do see the Daji and the Kamazots band away from the Valhalla Valkyries. They are not interested in playing against that again. They are not, and I'm keeping an eye here, Judas, because Valkyries get the first selection for the first time this set, and I was thinking maybe they go for the solar end because it's been pretty consistently top-picked, but very clearly they are very much on board with the Erupt Crimson Pele, and they at least hover it and think about it. A lot of attention to dual lane is pretty common. I think that picking a mid laner here, and yes, I'm calling Paley a mid laner at the start of the lobby before anything else gets picked. <laughs> That's kind of where we're at now. But anyway, yep. a lot of attention on dual lane is usually pretty highly prioritized. But I mean, both of the, what I would argue to be, or excuse me, all three of what I consider to be the top guardians taken off the board, Ganesh, Yamoja, and Athena in no particular order. And with two magical ADCs available in the Oleron and either the Soul or the Freya, you do get your pick of which one. Valkyries weren't forced to pick one or the other because they're guaranteed at least one. Sages were never going to pick Soul, Oleron, Soul, Freya in any combination. So it does give them at least the opportunity to go back to the Wowie Freya and I think you probably do here, but instead they're going to shift toward the soul. I don't think that the Freya was at all the problem. I think that was the solution for the Valkyries, but they're moving away from it anyway. Yeah, good for the Sages here to uh, bring back the Griff Oleron, which of course struggled so much into Sam for Sokka's Thor. So you just pick Thor as well. Uh, almost acting as a pseudo ban, uh, but I do agree with you somewhat. I think Soul maybe does a little bit better into Thor, of course. That disapparate can go through player made walls, so it does at least provide a little bit of extra safety. But some extra player made walls coming through as this Terra gets picked up by the Sages as well. It's uh, tough to call with these two drafts. You know, both these two teams have shown they can uh, at all times square up. No matter what the draft is, so uh, I'm, I'm, you know, without even judging these drafts, I'm just excited to see how this game's gonna go. <laughs> just as a spectator of the sport, it's a really this is fun a fan, to right? Watch. Yeah, <laughs> totally agree. And it's the the Morgan Lefay actually looked at here from the Athenian Jesus. Sages. So a completely different look from what we've seen so far from Nehu. It's been all assassins up until this point. It's been the set, and then followed up by another assassin in the following game. The first time he gets his hands on a real magical character that will deal relevant AoE damage in a team comp that has a lot of very high single target damage. I typically think of Thor as you maybe hit one or two people with a crowd control, but more often than not, you're locking them down for follow-up damage from this Oleron, which, again, very low area damage, very high single target gives you an option to really spread this terror ult a little bit more effectively and also something that contends a little bit better with what i thought would be another assassin in the mid lane but it's actually this thoth here which means that sam for soccer is likely to be the one taking this pele away yeah there's so much intrigue of course on both sides uh, with this thor and ratatasker being locked in that puts one of them into the solo lane and rather than uh you know, discuss and speculate. How about oh, we just go on. and find I, I out? Let's one. head bring, on in to, to me, this Jesus. game. I will see exactly how it goes. It is Snanny on, on the Thor in solo and the Ratataska Come jungle. I'll, 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 I'll give you the chance to, to, to show off how smart you are, Kaizo. Is that how you would have put it? Yeah, yeah, Judas, it is how I would have put it. And if yeah, you sure, likely the, story. If you watch Salt <laughs> number one all the way back in January, Snatty won the entire tournament for his team on the signature Thor solo. And Jengaru, even all the way back in the console days, was well known to be a fiend on the Ratatoskers. So, I, you know, Judas, I would have staked my life on this bet. And you didn't <laughs> even give me the opportunity, man. That is criminal. Well, you know, it, it, it's something that... You know, the average Smite player would have probably put down as well. I think uh, Ratatasker at the moment is one of those premier junglers 
by, by quite some distance just because of the uh, flexibility of that through the cosmos, right? It's Definitely. not quite as committed uh, as the Anvil of Dawn coming through. You know, it, it, that's quite a telegraphed ability, whereas Jengaru, you know, has the option to go in, but also the option to just get out at any time. And it's, it's a lot more uh, difficult to read exactly what this Ratatasker sure. is thinking. So interesting to see exactly when uh, Jengaru opts to get active here. And I do think that it is worth pointing out as well that the Ratatosker build path, probably better for the jungle right now, just because of the fact that Breastplate is so good, you can get that as a sole defense item in the jungle, and then get that double flurry acorn and take oh, a Hammy. lot of damage as Hammy is here. Oh, fantastic shell. Will it be enough? No, it shall not. The fireballs from Wowie, just so strong. And that is a third time in a row that the Valhalla Valkyries dual lane shall pick up first blood. Not a trend the Athenian Sages will like to keep seeing. Probably not. And it once again goes down onto Wowie for that first blood. Keep in mind, this is exactly how game number one started. Except instead it was, I believe, Griff that took that spill. He at least manages to survive the laning phase for oh, yeah. the first minute and 20 seconds of game number three <laughs> here. And feel at least a little bit more comfortable. But Valkyries are very accustomed at this point to playing around this duo lane and making sure that you hand Wowie the world. And this guy definitely does a whole lot with the world in his hands. It's going to be on the Athenian Sages once again to determine... Do we rotate somebody over here to the dual lane, try to shut this down, try to get Griff online? Because keep in mind, Griff is kind of the main character of the Athenian Sages draft. Or do we once again go to the middle lane? I mean, it's the mages in the mid for the first time. It's a con considerably different landscape for the mid lane that we've seen up until this point in this set. And it's also a very volatile solo lane as well. It's an assassin for Snatty this time, which does higher burst damage, but also much more susceptible to receiving some kind of gank from Sam for Soccer. A couple of different options here for how the Sages want to play the map. It's going to be interesting to see if they elect to stifle some of the pressure that comes out of the dual lane here or transition their attention elsewhere. Well, I've just spotted another opportunity for you to flex your solo lane knowledge and specifically your Snatty lore. As yeah. we do see an interesting item being built up first by Snatty after that blue stone pendant. Will that be the rune, uh, rune forged hammer we have sometimes been seeing lately? We'll just keep an eye on how this little scrap goes on the left hand side while you think of your answer there. Griffin Hammy wanting to defend this gets a good route coming through, but it's so low is the objective and it will go the way of the Valhalla Valkyries with the first invade of the game. Well, to answer your question, Judas, this is almost certainly going to be a Runeforged Hammer, not specific to Snatty, just an incredibly good Thor item. Thor's whole bit in the solo lane is that he's relatively tanky, but he still has enough damage to lock somebody down and kill them. As Ratatoskr in the air here lands on Wowie. Fantastic beads from Wowie there. Now Gamma might be the target instead. Actually dashes in aggressively and does get locked down by Hammy. Can Griff find enough shots? Not quite. I bet you have the sustain coming through. So that's the first gank attempt from Jenkaru on this Ratatask. It does get the all-important purification beads, though, but Sampa Soccer is here and has an angle. Great knock-up there coming through from Grip of the Volcanic Lightning. It's great over the wall. It's fantastic coming out from Hammy, and that shuts down all aggression on this left-hand side. A very weird engage there from Sam for Soccer, right? Because we saw, obviously, he wanted the knock-up earlier on, but... Looked like it got canceled out by that consecration from Griff, that little baby knockup and a little bit of heal that he gets in the kit. And that might have weirded out Sam for soccer because it looked like that interaction was not going to go in that direction. But because it does manage to at least momentarily slow down the aggression, Sam is forced to take a little bit more evasive maneuvers as the wall comes out from Hammy, as you mentioned, and burn the volcanic lightning perhaps earlier than he otherwise would have liked to. Little very small, very niche interaction, but might have just been enough to save the life of the ADC. Yeah, it, it comes down to those minimal micro plays uh, at this sort of level as well, where, uh, you know, nine times out of ten, uh, I think Pele can sweep up a few kills there, but uh, 
Because of the nature of this counterplay style, Sampasok opts to hold the Volcanic Lightning to avoid likely a wall coming out from Hammy to stop it. Uh, but that ends up getting hit by the Consecration instead, like you said. And uh, it, it is all about those small margins because you know we could be looking at a 2-0 Pele here and all of a sudden it's three kills to zero in favor of the Valks. And that's a scary spot for the Sages to be in. But as it stands, we find ourselves in a relatively even game. In fact, the Sages fighting back a lot of that gold differential from the early first blood. Yeah, they're farming pretty effectively here, and I think that a lot of that is likely due to the fact that the solo lane is a little bit more volatile. Whether or not a wave gets pushed into tower is less about the lane matchup and more about who just has more health and has backed more recently. I think that both of them can pretty reasonably contend with some of that neutral farm as well and feel pretty confident that they're going to be the ones to come out on top. But otherwise, I mean, it's just the Sages farming well. They're not really forfeiting any of their farm. You can see Sam for Soccer at least poking and prodding around this red buff, trying to get the speed timer. They want to force the issue, but the Sages are doing an excellent job of securing their own farm, fighting over what mid camps they can, and making sure that they don't give anything up for free. You are fighting in this duel lane, though. It's almost soul lane style, but wow, Nehu. And Jengaru, quite That's... low health. Well, that is a crazy uh -huh. dive in, just showing the confidence that Jengaru is playing with. Uh, possibly at this stage, already aware that they were getting the promotion. So just trying to fight in this <laughs> SCC instead. That's wild. Yeah, <laughs> just wanted to flex a little, you know. Uh, but like you said, it's been measured from both sides. The Valhalla Valkyries may be forcing the issue a touch more, but Jengaru has, has shown they are more than willing to get active and aggressive in this jungle at this stage. You know, I, I've got my eye on these builds, Judas, and tell me if you see two things that I see, or rather that I don't see in this game right now. Uh, I mean, if, if, if we're doing it Hazer style, I could do my best Gordon Ramsay impression because there is <laughs> two recipes that have been forgotten. Different roles, though. Sam for soccer for getting it, as well as Nehu. How much will this affect this early stages? How will this affect LeBron's legacy is really the question that you need to ask <laughs> yourself, Judas. And the answer for those of you at home is steal attempt unsuccessful there from Hammy. Recipes will not... Well, hang on. Fight coming in here. Horror Assault lands on top of Griff. There's the stun. He's got Pele coming, but it's pretty oh. far off. That's a good supernova damage as well, but Griffith can fight back, sustain pretty good between the Consecration and, of course, the little bits of Terra healing as well. Sam Fasaka looping all the way around and decides that will not be enough. So, back to LeBron's legacy. Yes, back to LeBron's <laughs> legacy. I think that he is still the GOAT, even if you don't get two <laughs> recipes here, because they're not the end of the world. I mean, you do get one of the things that not a lot of players know, because it's actually not in the text on the recipes, is you get a very small amount of gold for evolving yeah. the recipes. You get, I think it's something like 50 or 75 gold. So That's it right, is yeah. at least worth getting. Like, there's no downside to picking them up. But it isn't going to change the landscape of a fight. I mean, it's an extra two seconds on one of your cooldowns if you're going for a bountiful bow. It's another one auto attack worth of damage for party punch. It's probably not going to change the game. Emma gets locked down, gets knocked up as well. Of course, not able to fly to the skies and escape, but Sam Fasaka swoops in with the Volcanic Lightning and shall blow up Griff. Now, Jangaro ults it in, but now wants to get back out. That's another purple buff contested by the Valk. They don't get the buff. They instead take the kill. And they're playing this very cleanly around the duo lane. They're not really interacting in a whole lot of other parts on the map. It's been Sam Fasaka kind of scouting out the right hand side of the jungle but not forcing the issue too often I feel like in game number two there were a lot more jungle 1v1s that we saw between sam and jangaru but this time around it's much more around the shield buff and making sure that they keep wowie ahead they did manage to obviously secure quite the serious lead over there but they might have gotten a little bit complacent with how far ahead wowie was and this time around does not look like that is the case they are dumping all of the resources on the map into ensuring that the soul is farther ahead of the Olorun. And in particular, I think they're doing an excellent job of shutting down the Olorun and preventing him from getting the farm even passively. 
It's been a lot of horror assaults in onto the shield buff. It's been a couple of different times Sand for Soccer has poked his head over here, only now getting the first payoff in the form of a kill, but forcing those beads, forcing the sink to fight field as often as possible, and making sure that they can't feel comfortable over there, even though the lead here in game three is significantly less than it was in game two. I think uh, Griff might have some nightmares about having to pick Olorun ever again. It's just not going the way you expect it to go. Uh, Olorun, and the, oh no, look at this. <laughs> right in the backside, a long range. Horasalt comes through. Good Sanctified Fields though, actually shuts down a lot of the early aggression in this fight. But the damage is just so high. And the tankiness of Gamma Great is good stun. enough. Hammy locks them in though. And will get the revenge kill at least. Meanwhile, a kill goes on the right hand side. Snanny and Jengaru combining to take down Aquarius. But Nehu so shall low. fall as well. Across the entire map we have have a two for two overall but it's the first two kills for the athenian sages and i'll eat crow man i said that it was all duo lane action but very immediately it became action everywhere and now with this opportunity it's going to be another gold fury pull here for the valhalla valkyries but no team fight preceding this no low health bars no everybody coming up for the athenian sages means that they should be able to just grab that one and get on out and not repeat the performance of game number two, which will put them a little bit more comfortably in the lead. It's not a exasperatingly large lead. No, it's not about 1,500, 1,900. Don't do math on cast. 1,900. There we go. See, I can do Hold it. on. And it's a lot of attention from the Athenian Sages on the right-hand side of the map again. They're playing around Snatty. They're shutting down Aqua and making sure that they get some of this Wait. invade farm. Surely he doesn't go for this, right? It's Jangaro, so you don't really know, but the, the answer is no yeah, on this occasion. He already got the promotion, Judas. <laughs> right? Like, like, what do you got to lose at this point? Who cares if the Sages lose this game, am I right? No, I think Jangaro, of course, playing this to the best of his ability. Let's not mix any words here. Slander. Um <laughs> Let's get the slander out, but oh my goodness, the slander that Wowie is putting onto Griff right now gets the consecration for some safety, actually just goes for the farm at the end of the day, seals their fate, does Wowie, and that shall be another kill, both supports. <laughs> just kind of mirroring each other right there. Uh, Crimson will tip the scales in favor of the Valks, and not a lot that Hammy can do about this first one. But again, as we saw in game number two, the Valhalla Valkyries dual lane just shining so, so strongly. And that is kind of how this matchup goes between Sol and Olaren. It doesn't take a whole lot to tip the scales in one direction or the other. But one thing that absolutely can't... He's going to land in on this wave, isn't he? Yep, just got to yep. clear the wave. One of the things that absolutely can tilt the scales in one direction or the other in the Sol versus Olaren matchup is the status of the Olaren ult. And Griff didn't have that one available for another, call it 15, 20 seconds or so. Looked like one quarter of the diamond still unavailable for the ADC for the Athenian Sages. And that means that Sol wins that every single time. There is no argument for if they fight to the death, who is going to be grabbing it. It's just a wonder that Griff was willing to step up with that cooldown unavailable. And obviously he thought that he was safer than he was, maybe thought he had help coming or something, but regardless of what created that circumstance, it was an excellent capitalization from Wowie there. And now he's off to that two level lead that we saw in game number two. So it's going to have to be another continuation of the same for the Athenian Sages, where they have to fight around the mid lane, where it's looked like Crimson has had a stranglehold there, because look what's happening in duo. Well, Griff does manage to fight back against Samphasaka. No Volcanic Lightning available, but the shots are actually pretty good. And on the way is the rest of the Valhalla Valkyries to save the life of Samphasaka. Hammy can do nothing but watch as Griff falls down for a fourth time this game. It is nightmare scenario for the left-hand side of the map of the Sages. Can they find enough to make up for it on the right-hand side, though? Doesn't look like it so far, but they still have plenty of time left in this game. And after the way that game two went, Judas, I mean, if, if I was the casual Twitch chat viewer, I might have been doing something else on my other monitor at about 15 minutes into the game because it didn't look like the Sages were going to break back into it. And I'll be frank here, Judas, and you can be Larry. It doesn't look like they're going to break back into this game three either. And yet we can't afford to count them out, especially with 
now this rotation from Sol into the mid lane, they're fighting where they don't have their strongest opportunity. This could be the Sage's moment to strike back here while the Anvil is hot. Well, Pyromancer does get started up by the Valkyries. The Sages have the vision on this. Snatty wants to go up, but it is too fast. The burn do it. coming out from San Francisco is too high. Yeah, he did it! <laughs> the, the man <laughs> did it. Guy. For whatever too. reason, He's dead. actually He's threw dead. the hammer. Right, surely Snatty is going down here, although it's a pretty good knockup immunity there as well. Burns the shot as well. Uh -huh. Jukes out! San Francisco uh -huh. on the volcanic lightning. Jukes out! The final judgment and survives it! Does Snatty, but can the Sages find anything? to make up for it. No, not even a tier 1 tower in the left-hand side. Jengaru all the way just invading camps. Tier 1 tower being aggressed on. Senfasaka takes some damage, but Gamma shall heal it back up. Nehu in some trouble. Gets a nice Aegis Amulet off. Triple Root comes out from Hammy. It is just the tier 1 tower, but what is going on with Snaddy, dude? This guy needs, like, some safety lessons or something. I, 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 there must be something in the water, man, because there were a couple of questionable things that just happened in that engagement very close to one another. I mean, as soon as Snatty threw the hammer, I said, this guy is dead because he should be dead there. But that's in the event that Sam for Soccer lands Volcanic Lightning, the Erupt Crimson's on the mark with Final Judgment. I mean, there, there are steps that are required to get a kill in the game of Smite Judas. Most of them involve either crowd controlling or dealing damage to the enemy. And I feel like we skipped a couple of steps on the way to trying to bring down Snatty there. Yeah, it, it was at the point where he was so dead that the Valhalla Valkyries kind of took it complacently. That it should have been an easy target, but somehow, Snatty gets out alive. Didn't get too much of value from it, but did at least get a little bit. And uh, right now we're seeing some pressure on this left-hand side again. Father Valkyries looking to set up for this next Gold Fury, the Primal Fury. And actually already have the Oracles covered. It is still... 16 minutes into the game and quite a sizable lead for the Valhalla Valkyrie. So when it is such a deficit, what should the Athenian Sages be looking to do in order to get their best engagement? The, the Sages comms right now, if it hasn't already gotten to this point, should be discussing what they're staking their claim on. Because if you let a lead like this run rampant, it's only going to snowball into a bigger lead. That means that you're giving up all the neutral farm, you're letting them grab the minor objectives, and not contending with any of them. You need to pick your moment if that's the Gold Fury fight, which, based on the positioning, looks like very unlikely to be this primal fury that the Valhalla Valkyries are doing right now. You need to decide where you're putting your foot down and beginning to take your first real 5-on-5 five -five team fight with the Valkyries. Sages don't think that's just yet, clearly wanting maybe a couple more power spikes in the items. Their ADC is remarkably far behind at this point. I mean, three levels, an item and a half down on his opposition means that it's very difficult for the Sages to comfortably say, we can take a fight here and try to change the landscape of the game. Looks like they're going for it in left lane, or at least Jingaru is hovering around to keep Griff safe. But we're unlikely to see, based on the way they just played that Primal Fury, the Sages do much of anything until something big is threatened. I'm talking they group up for a Tier 2 Tower for the Valkyries. I'm talking Fire Giant available for them. Until we get to one of those large objectives on the map, it's unlikely that the Sages will attempt to step up and make something happen. The Sages are playing it carefully. Have lost two of their tier one towers. It is just the one in the solo lane still standing. Snatty, of course, having a relatively fine game over here. Uh, hasn't had too much impact, but has had some moments, which does mean that uh, you know there is something for the Sages to bank their hat on. But right now, it, it's just difficult for this door to get too involved. You know, you want to keep farming so you can at least be relevant later on, have the tankiness and the damage. Has gone free almost purely defensive style build has Snanny so far. Uh, but Hammy level 12 on this tower, 19 minutes in. It's just tough at the moment for the dual laners of the Sages because when you are this far down, everything becomes more difficult. Everything does, and they're still a little while off of a couple of key spikes. Once they get those items finished in those fourth slots there, you can see likely a spirit robe. Well, hang on, we're got a little bit of action here, so might need to hold that thought. But once you get spirit robe finished, serrated edge, soul reaver, a couple of very critical items that are 
one step away from being finished, I think then you can at least start to have the conversation of, well, do we take the off-balance fight, let Griff get some farm and left while everybody else tries to defend this fire giant? And I think that the answer is yes. I think that allowing Griff to get that farm and at least attempting the 4v5 around the FG Hold might right be your side. best option at this point. There's a bit of action. Jengaru is extremely low. Gets up into the through the cosmos. Goes back in inexplicably and falls down to Sam for soccer. Had barely any health to work with. Uh, did the Ratatasca there. Uh, Gamma stepping up after having peeled far there. Jungler Snaddy as well trying to get involved in this fight. Wants to take the fight okay. to Sam for soccer and shall do so. That mule is attunement double tap. No matter how tanky you are, still hurts plenty. Gamma is still here because Wowie is still here. They knock down that tower and right, but unlikely to do much of anything else while they're over here, unless Nehu oh, potentially dear. gets caught here by Crimson, but looks like after that one little skirmish, they'll back up, and Aquarius is surely he's not taking this fight to the death with the Oleron, because even level 16, Oleron ult is an excellent tool for this 1v1, but now that it's down, this could be trouble. Looks like no, because Snatty teleports in behind. For all that Ooh. bluster, it's just the ults traded and no relics expended, save for the teleport from Snatty to make sure that Griff gets on out of there okay. And I'm kind of holding my breath here, Judas, because it is it feels like we're building toward a head where we're yep. one step away from that climax of the game. It's going to be one team fight that will break this game open and if that's in favor of the Sages, we're talking a full reset of game momentum where every fight that they attempt to take is on equal footing and they can finally start to call their own shots, try to move toward winning the game instead of trying to not lose the game. But if the fight goes in favor of the Valkyries, game broken wide open. I mean, if you get even one or two kills in some of these engagements for the Valhalla Valkyries, we're talking Fire Giant, that's going to be a tier two tower more than likely, potentially a Phoenix, depending on the state of the fight and where it's taken. All of it is coming from this next team fight, and it's looking more and more likely to be around this Fire Giant. We got those items finished off more than at least most of them for the Athenian Sages. This is about as strong as you're going to get before the Valhalla Valkyries force you to take some kind of engagement. And I'd like to see them send Griff over to the Fire Giant, understanding that the moment might be coming sooner rather than later. Looks like they're instead going to send him to get a little bit more farm, collect a couple more levels, but it's only a matter of time before the Valkyries decide no more time to farm. It is finally the time to fight. Yeah, the Valhalla Valkyries are fast approaching that stage where they will just be too far ahead for the Sages to take a reasonable fight. We might already even be at that point because uh -oh, this 8,000 gold lead now is a lot of trouble, but Griff has been pinged out on the map, has channeled the back, but Crimson shall stop it. Griff just falls down here. Oh, oh man, Crimson just does it all by themselves. Slams down this all around. So 40 seconds is the power play window for the Valhalla Valkyries, as if they even needed it. Looks like they're taking no rush to get for this fire giant, but with the Titans pushing out, this is just going to be another difficult defense for the Sages to put up with. And this is where, if you're the Valkyries, you're looking to develop your positioning around the Fire Giant, even though you have Griff on the respawn timer. You don't have to rush anything here. You can pull the objective now, but there's just no reason to. With the Titans respawning, Pyromancer also up on the map, could wait it a little bit longer, but they're going to pull it and see what the response time is here from the Sages. It's already about three quarters, and they got to get in here soon. Snaddy, of course, revealing it to the Sages. 50% HP is the Fire Giant. No massive secure on the side uh, of the Athenian Sages, so they have to take a fight. Goes down onto Wowie, does Snaddy. Diving deep, teleports back out. Fire Giant still very low HP. And Sanford Sokka's all the way in the backside. The Athenian Sages are on the retreat. The objective has been dropped for the time being. Jengaru, however, all the way on the left-hand side of the map, not interested in taking this fight. So the Athenian Sages will give up this first major objective in lieu of getting some additional farm. What do you think of that call, Kaizo? Is that the right move here? 
I think they didn't have much of another opportunity. If the initial engage there on the Fire Giant looked a little bit more promising, then potentially you stake the game on that call alone. You are getting to the point here where 8, 9,000, 10,000 gold and Fire Giant, you're dice rolling some of these team fights to see if you can get back into it. They're not going to be comfortable anymore, so you've got to take the off-balance fight and see if it goes well for you, but... I think that they did everything they could to try to stop them from doing that, save for just gambling the entire game on that engagement. That does mean that this next fight is not going to be a whole lot of fun with the Titan coming down, though. The Titan makes their way into the Phoenix. Gamma goes up into the sky, provides a bit of shielding for their team. Aquarius diving deep on the backside. Thor dunks in onto three, as does Jinkaru. Wow, he is so low, but gets into the Disaparate. And the Aegis Amulet. Gamma also no HP to work with, and falls down. Snatty now giving chase to this soul, but the healing is pretty good. Hammy puts out some damage as well. Aquarius, so fighting back, has got some room to work with. Sampa Soccer lurking on the right-hand side. The fight looked good initially for the Sages, but with only the one pick and the Phoenix going down, the Valhalla Valkyries more than happy with how that engagement goes. And the Sages, despite getting, or excuse me, the, the Valkyries, despite getting one bird there, aren't super unsatisfied with the way that went. I think that if they got anything more than that, they would probably be pl pretty pleasantly surprised. They didn't reset after doing the Fire Giant. They only marched it down while they had the Titan available and tried to potentially gamble their Fire Giant on that push. I think that there's a real world where that doesn't go well for you, but they're taking the fight here onto Griff, and he doesn't have the fields available. 2v2 to work with, but no Sanctified Fields. Wow, he's already used the Supernova. There comes the Anti-Heal coming out. Aquarius is just swinging away and sustaining through this fight. The shots come back from come Griff, and that shall be enough. But the Semi-Global's on the way. The squad is in the air. Drop shipping down. Just out of range is Snatty, but onto Aquarius goes Jengaru. But here come the reinforcements on the other side. Sanctified Fields does come out. Gamma step furthest forward. The final judgment slowly catches down Hammy. And now the retreat comes out from the Sages, nice wall coming out from Snatty. Oh, Sampa look at the Soccer flank. Making the rotation coming in, has the flank, has the speed increase. Griff has nowhere to go, but Sampa Soccer has the world at their fingertips and slams down through Griff. Now poking down is Erupt Crimson, dashing in is Erupt Crimson, gets the beads and Aegis from Nehu. Sampa Soccer still has that volcanic lightning to work with, and the tower is being tanked up by Aquarius. In the meantime, this left side Phoenix now in big danger, and the Athenian Sages shall sacrifice it it is just a few more shots needed teleport back in from aquarius not even needed two phoenixes down valhalla valkyries sitting in a fantastic position and that's not the first time that we've seen aquarius make an impromptu arrival at that shield buff and catch griff a little bit unawares when maybe he might have been anticipating he just grabs that backs up and then goes back to farming they kind of forced him to fight there with the ult unavailable, and it looked sketchy for both teams until all of the cavalry arrived, and the Sages had a very narrow window of opportunity to work within that fight. Once Jangaru lands, once Snatty lands, and they don't immediately blow up Wowie and get on out of there. That is immediately alarm bells ringing for the Chaos side. They should have immediately backed up there and realized all of the Valkyries are not going to let this engagement happen and left without rotating in. And the fact that they attempted to take that fight and still try to at least get a couple of kills there, despite the fact that the rest of the Valkyries were coming in, tells you that the Sages are in a little bit of desperation mode here. I think that if they somehow win... The oh, man, not again with Griff. Oh, Griff. At this point, just leave the lane. Drops the Sanctified Fields as well. I will surely be falling down in a moment. Erupt Crimson will be the one to take that kill. That Sanctified Field ultimate but it's so, so important. And actually, you know, is it even longer cooldown than the respawn time? Now in the mid lane, the Athenian Sages are stepped up. Nehu in massive trouble as managing to retreat does dodge out. That final judgment, Great Wall from Gamma, will prevent some of the aggression. But diving forward with the ultimate is this Horus. Erupt Crimson so low. Snatty can't find the last shot. Finally shall do so. Jengaru gets a good fight on the Sampa Soccer. This fight's getting better for the Sages. Two for two so far, but no Fire Giant on the map. Hammy low health. And that's why we're getting into the Disapparate form. Snatty gets some damage out. Has to teleport away. But Fire Minions are pushing in on this left-hand side. The mid lane Phoenix has respawned. Hammy will surely be falling to Aquarius in just a moment. 
fact they want to give the kill to Wowie, it looks like. Overall, I think that's kind of okay for the Sages. You do stall out this game just that bit more. Yeah, oddly enough, I, I, I find myself agreeing, despite how scary that fight looked at certain times and the fact that Griff dies again in left lane, now the seventh death on this Ola run to just everybody collapsing on him knowing he's just walking it down the lane complacently. It's actually not the worst spot for the Athenian Sages. They get the middle bird back up. Fire Giant is due to respawn and actually has respawned, meaning that they're going to have to get here sooner rather than later with this taking over to EFG in a good 10 seconds or so. But that buys them at least a little bit of time to walk on over and allow Hammy to respawn potentially and make their way into this Fire Giant pit. This is a you must defend this kind of Fire Giant for yep. the Sages. We'll see how they decide to take the fight. It is do or die for the Athenian Sages, and they are here to defend it. It is always tough to take a Fire Giant with a Thor around, and Snatty does take to the skies. That will be the call to retreat for the Athenian Sages. Actually, will go in. Gets caught, though. Manages to teleport away with the Purification Beads to the sky. Also goes Jengaro on this through the cosmos, and yet again, Aquarius shall pull the objective now. Snatty in big trouble because Sam Soccer is swinging away and this time Sal secure the kill. Now jumping forward is Gamma with the backup. Griff drops the Sanctified Fields to keep themselves safe. But that is another big team fight ultimate off the table. The Fire Giant still stands, but the Valhalla Valkyries have an even better position to take it. And Snatty just goes in a little bit too deep there. That's actually the first spill that he's taken, but it's a pretty critical one here as he overextends and then perhaps overstays his welcome. And what was a do-or-die Fire Giant enhanced version here for the Athenian Sages now is completely forfeit because they use the, the Anvil of Dawn very early on. The Valhalla Valkyries hear that cooldown immediately back up very well-disciplined gameplay from the Order side. And Jangaroo also used the Through the Cosmos, seeing that Snatty was going in, thinking I might need to help my solo laner here. And that's Thanks. just two crucial cooldowns unavailable immediately for the Sages. Now they have to worry about the Valkyries just walking it in and taking this bird. Bomb used, no fight necessary here, but they're going to take it anyway. Oh, Snatty gets a good dunk yet again. Can they have the follow-up damage to work with, though? Hammy is low, but jumping forward is Jengaru. Gets to re-engage. Sanfasaka goes in with the Volcanic Lightning. Doesn't quite hit enough targets there, but the health bars are still pretty good. The sustain is decent from the Valhalla Valkyries, and they have this enhanced Fire Giant. It means that it is easy pickings. Take down that weakened mid Phoenix and surely be turning their attention to this weakened left side Phoenix, too. And this is probably the moment where if you're a Sages fan, you're going to have to be holding your breath because they don't get the opportunity to give up this next Phoenix and then still feel good about the potential outcome of this game. Fighting with one Phoenix down is already hard enough, but you give up two Phoenixes, in particular middle lane plus insert side lane here, and defending that third bird becomes next to impossible. We're talking you have to fight them while they're pushing up the waves and just hope that they let you fight them because they really don't have to. They can just allow you to slowly die to the thousand ticks of minion damage. It's going to be on this left-hand Phoenix, more likely than not, that the Sages have to all in and hope that the fight goes their way. They do have a couple of pretty crucial beads cooldowns unavailable for the Valhalla Valkyries. Namely, Crimson doesn't have those for 60 seconds. Looks like Wowie used it on about the same timer. So if they try to push in while those are still unavailable, while these Oni fire waves are coming in, that might be the best shot for the Athenian Sages. We'll see if the Valkyries give them that opportunity. Great poke onto Erupt Crimson does mean that there would be an opportunity if this toad is to be caught out with the left side Phoenix still just over half HP. Aquarius making sure these minions get shuttled in to that Going Titan room. It. Up to the sky goes Snatty, down onto Wowie they go. That'll put the first push out, but Tenfa Soccer puts out some poke themselves. Aquarius still being in that worst possible position, and the poke coming through from a Grup Crimson is great, and it does create the space needed for the Valhalla Valkyries to take down this left side Phoenix. Where do they go next, though? Do they take the Tier 2 on right, or do they just go for the end? Tier 2 seems to be the call, at least tentatively. They'll send Sam for Soccer there oh, by himself, snatty. and Snatty goes in. This is their one shot. 
This is their one shot. Can they take it? A Grub Crimson low health, but Aquarius creating so much space. Nehu forced into the ultimate as well. Doesn't have that for safety any longer. Aquarius is not taking a lot of damage, only now reaching half HP. Erupt Crimson still low. Snatty finds a good shot and the ticks come through, but not quite enough just yet. Erupt Crimson still alive with a small amount of HP to work with. Aquarius now being engaged on. Bees come out from Rattle. the Amaterasu. Rat comes through. Jengaru gives chase. Jengaru gets the kill. What about after the fact though? Darts on away. Zephyrsaka gives chase. Another decent defense from the Athenian Sages. They are on on their last legs, but they are using their last legs. Rough Crimson just about walks in a range of Snatty. The big damage comes through. Not quite enough. A great save from Gamma shall keep this Toth alive. But alive are the Athenian Sages to fight another fight. And shocking no one, two of our best SCC teams play that textbook on defense and on offense. The Valkyries know the one opportunity that the Athenian Sages have to get back into this game is if we take a bad fight and allow them to t make us 5v5 them, essentially. Because the Valkyries want to get away with the left Phoenix like a thief in the night and then reset and siege right once they have both birds down. And the Sages know that they're not going to give them a comfortable 5v5 fight. It has to be scrappy, it has to be in and out, it has to be Jangaru and Snatty using the ults interchangeably, forcing them forward and making them take the fight, thinking that they had some kind of advantage. And unfortunately for the Sages, they just don't manage to land sufficient enough damage onto the team of the Valkyries to come away with enough kills to f push themselves forward. They do get the middle Phoenix back up. They hold the base. They don't lose the left-hand bird. So that does mean that if we go for another Siege defense, things aren't looking as bad as they could be. But now it's once again, Judas, around this enhanced Fire Giant side of the map. And they have so much coverage around the left-hand side with all those sentry wards to know exactly if and when somebody's going to be defending those wards, whether or not they'll have the man advantage here in the pit. It looks like the Sages are just going to attempt to take the all-in 5v5 fight here around the Enhanced Fire Giant, and all the Valkyries have to do is wait for that wave to push up and left, play it a bit slow, and wait for the Sages to continue to get desperate. What a game this is, where even after all of the suffering the Sages have gone through, there is still massive jeopardy for the Valhalla Valkyries. They do pull this enhanced Fire Giant, and the Sages are here to defend it. Left side Fire Minions are running on in. This Fire Giant is about 50% HP. Gamma playing Soul Zona, and up to Snatty. the sky goes Snatty. That is the retreat Great call disengage. yet again. For the Valhalla Valkyries all dis disengaging in sync, but hold on, the Fire Giant has been started up by the Sages, it's very low, it's going to be brawled out from both sides, but the Valhalla Valkyries will take it, Crimson Falls in the process, in goes Sampasaka, blasting away onto Griff and onto Nehu, Nehu with no backup, but Wowie has fallen on the backside, fighting back is this Morgan Le Fay, Aquarius is the only one to take them down, Snatty now, rolling it out with Gamma, Jengaru there to help too, Nehu is doing everything they can all by themselves, but they they shall fall down to Sam for soccer and Aquarius, but the health bar is big for our Snatty. Can they find any shots? Gets a tectonic rift out. Where is Jingaru to help them out? They're on to Gamma, taking the fight to this Horus, but the Horus fights on back. Aquarius coming in as well. Left side thinks will be falling. Double stun comes out from Jingaru, but it is not enough. Snatty is now one versus three of three very tanky targets what do the valhalla valkyries do they have the healing coming out from this efg snatty takes to the sky and shall retreat there is a minion wave pouring into the left hand side can the valhalla valkyries get in and end the game or will the sages be able to defend five seconds left on hammy will the support spawn in time snatty already cc good damage from aquarius on this bird Looks like the Terra's gonna be there to defend left lane, but that leaves Snatty all by himself. 1v3, he is an insufficient force to push back the Valhalla Valkyries. But we can take a breath, Judas, for the first uh. time in what feels like several minutes. <sighs> Let's go back to that Fire Giant bolt, because what a messy fight it turned into. The Valhalla Valkyries wanted to force the Sages to fight them, wanted to get the desperation mode kicking in. And they get the Snatty ult, they immediately back up. And while the Valkyries back up, all of the Athenian Sages decide, we need to do something here, we can't give up the Thor ult cooldown for free. 
and they pick up the fire giant at half HP, drop the Griffolt on top of it, sanctify every single field around that fire giant, and do their best to just secure it. They fought into the Horusult, into the Absolution proc from the Horusult, which we haven't gotten to talk about yet, and essentially gambled the game on that one engagement. They wanted the EFG on two, even one member, mostly they wanted to deny it to the Valhalla Valkyries. They said, this is our best opportunity to force them to fight. If we let them back up, they're going to bleed us dry with the minions and left. And they all in commit to the one singular fight around the EFG. And it was a worthwhile attempt, but unfortunately they don't manage to land it. They do scrape by with enough kills and enough members still alive to hold the base for now. But now it's EFG on three members, only the backliners for the Valhalla Valkyries lacking that crucial enhanced fire giant buff. And it's left Phoenix and right Phoenix down, which opens the door for a pincer maneuver for the Valhalla Valkyries to go for this last middle Phoenix and potentially go for this game. And the Valkyries finally find this killing blow. Gamma taking a few killing blows of their own. will have to retreat, but the Phoenix is so, so low. That is literally one HP. Erupt Crimson gets engaged on by Snatty, and Jengaru is nearby. Snatty gets a lot of damage out. Back now, while we in some danger, there is a backdoor attempt going on, and that will be that. The Valhalla Valkyries don't decide to take the dis the. the very, very difficult fight. They go for the easy fight and dive in behind. It was close. The Sages almost had it, but the Valhalla Valkyries use that veteranship and take down the game. And you can call it unhonorable or dis dishonest? Hang on. Un lack of dishonorable? Honor. Yeah. yeah, dishonorable. There you go. You can call it dishonorable to send two people to back door, but that was getting to the point where that was the only opportunity the Valkyries had left. The Sages played that game phenomenally from behind. Truly a masterclass on how you play the game from a significant deficit. They were clinging on by a thread for what felt like 20 or 25 minutes of that game, Judas. And they had all of the siege defenses perfect. They refused to give up any of the birds if they didn't have to. They step up, they coin flip the fire giant. They get enough value out of that fight that they can't end the game and strip the fire giant off of a couple of members. But the Valkyries, just the map momentum, the state of the game that it already was with both of those Phoenixes down was just too difficult for them to defend everything all at once. Too many plates to spin for the Athenian Sages, and despite the fact that they've proven very adept at spinning plates, Judas, just one too many that time around. Well, it was a fantastic end to what was a fantastic weekend of competitive smite, but that is actually it. We are finally done for this weekend, but it has been phenomenal. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in all weekend long. I've been Judas Priestley, joined today by Kaizo over there. And also in the background, we've had Rosie and Phoenix providing everything else that we need. But that is all from us. We'll see you again next weekend. <laughs>
Call me close and you say you'll never